what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete. Today I have the honor and privilege of being joined again by Dr. Eric Helms, who's a key contributor to the Swole Radio podcast and big influence on you know my, the content that I put out. And having met Eric recently at WNBF Worlds, I can say that in person, he is even more swole than what you see on camera. Well, I clearly need to do a better <laughs> job on camera, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> that's where most people get to see me so uh, was no, it was it busted. was it was great seeing you at worlds man and uh well done fantastic that was your first time competing at worlds right yep nice yeah it was a yeah. great great pro showing so well done thanks man very eye-opening so anyways today we are going to be going through eric's full training program revealed scandalous <laughs> nice <laughs> Revealed. I feel exposed. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting one for all the advanced trainees out there. You know, just seeing into what an advanced bodybuilder and um, powerlifter as well does with their training, and especially considering that Eric is leading into a contest prep himself. So, very cool topic today. And just as an initial disclaimer, I'll say that you know whenever we talk about our own training programs that this isn't something you just copy paste into your own training but you know just just consider things and i think that really trying to see the pr the principles behind what uh, eric does with his stuff and trying to extrapolate that to use to your own learning so i think this is going to be a fun one i think eric maybe just starting off giving the audience some broad strokes just summary of like your training history for sure. So I started training in 2004 and I had a pretty even split in my goals between powerlifting and bodybuilding at that point. Um, it took me obviously a few years to get to know what I was doing, but yeah, I would say initially I was kind of doing what we would probably describe as quote unquote power building today. Um, and I was doing a lot of exercises. I was using a body part split and I was training pass failure most of the time with four reps with my training partner. And I just trained hard and always tried to add weight and always tried to add reps. Um, the only real thing that actually changed in like kind of a systematic way is I would like cycle between like doing like eight, six, four, cause I'm always losing reps when you train to failure. Right. <laughs> and like 12, mm -hmm. 10, eight, um, and then when I would go heavy on stuff, I would just kind of do like fives for the most part or, or threes, um, sometimes mm -hmm. work up to a, like a, a heavy single. And then, then that, that was it. Um, I did have some elements of planning and progression to it, but they were relatively rudimentary. Uh, and I did my first powerlifting meet in a unsanctioned, um, YMCA competition where I worked and that was a push pull. So it was a, I think it's like an, August 2006 or something like that. And um, that was a bench press deadlift comp. And then I had my first uh, bodybuilding season in 07. Um, and then I was just basically training for bodybuilding and powerlifting simultaneously until 2011 when I started incorporating some Olympic weightlifting in. Um, and I had a little bit of interest in doing strongman in the time period before that but I didn't have access to anything. This was before CrossFit was big. It was before Strongman was accessible. Um, I was just interested in it and I found out about a local comp and this was in a time point where it was, let's say far less big and, and diverse with, with uh, Strongman. There wasn't like multiple weight classes. There was mm. the over 275 pound class and the under 275 pound class for men. Okay. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so for the lightweight class, I'm in the off season, 60 pounds lighter than, uh, than, than, than what I could be. Um, and I just couldn't even, I get zeros on almost all the events. So that, that kind of died away. And I was like, all right, I'm just not like back then strong men were people who got to elite levels in powerlifting and then decided that they wanted to do reps with it. So, uh, it's changed now, obviously there's different levels and it's far more, um, 
I guess, delineated. There's like amateur levels, there's the under 80 kilogram, under 90 kilogram classes, et cetera. There's different federations, yada, yada. But anyway, in 2011, I started getting into Olympic weightlifting because I knew that I was going to be coming out to uh, New Zealand, hmm. studying strength and conditioning, doing my master's, doing my PhD, and I wanted to have a broader um, kind of skill set. And then I also found that I really liked it. So I started training with Chip Conrad uh, in Sacramento who is kind of like a multidiscipline strength athlete, physical culturist, throwback dude, who is also just a man. And uh, he was my first Olympic weightlifting coach. And then in 2013, I started working with uh, Adam Story at North Sport Olympic Weightlifting Bar, uh, North Sport Barbell, or North Sport Olympic Weightlifting, and um, which is like in the same building where I was doing my PhD and my master's. So I did Olympic weightlifting, concentrated from uh, 2013 to 2014. And I stepped away from that and I was pretty much just doing, uh, powerlifting with some bodybuilding, um, for multiple years. And I did my first strongman training and competitions in 2018, 2019, 2020 range. So I've been kind of like a multidisciplinary strength slash physique athlete, um, taking different approaches over time. I've had some injuries. I competed in, I think I've competed in 20 powerlifting meets and maybe six or five or six Olympic weightlifting meets. And I've done two strongman event type competitions that weren't full, like five day meets, but like two event days. And I have done uh, four bodybuilding seasons and competed in 13 shows, something like that. So it's been a, a good mix. Uh, and that's kind of my training history, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. any other relevant questions that I glazed over or would it be useful to the listener you can think of? Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I think that definitely shows testament to how you're very experienced and in, in a broad array of disciplines as well. So I think, I think that's great from a programming perspective, because I think when you train for these different disciplines, even though they may not necessarily, even, even seeing things purely from a hypertrophy standpoint, I think you will draw conclusions or learn lessons from your time spending spent in these different disciplines you know and whether they be in, in the in realm of strength development or technique or or you know periodization and that kind of stuff absolutely if it's helpful to people um my best total in olympic weightlifting is 200 kilos which i did around 90 um my best total in powerlifting, you won't find an open powerlifting because nationals got canceled three days prior because of lockdown. But it's like six thirty, um, and I've done it that I've done at ninety three. Um, so my best individual lifts is uh, two twenty seven and a half squat, um, one fifty five bench. Although I've done one sixty five touch and go when I was a little more hefty, and a two sixty deadlift. So moderately average powerlifter for someone who's in the ninety three kilo class. Uh, and I compete in bodybuilding right around 80 kilos. I'm six foot and I'm turning 40 in April. So that's kind of where I'm at. So, yeah. Nice. This guy does not joke around. And actually, that's really useful because I know you all, you all get a barrage of comments being like, oh, how old are you? How tall are you? How much do you how weigh? How tall? How those, old? What do you weigh? All exactly. those what, questions. What's, what's your wrist measurement? <laughs> what's your FFMI? What zodiac sign are you? How much uh, of how, how much of your lineage is from the Caucasus Mountains? Yeah, do you have any Nordic lineage? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then and yeah, in terms of a zoomed out perspective, what does your training plan look like right now? Yeah, so I'm pretty much training entirely and exclusively for bodybuilding at the moment um, because I'm getting back on stage in 2023. Um, my prep is probably going to start mid February. And I plan to do shows in September, October, and November. So very much concentrating it towards the end of the year. I'd like to do Worlds, WMBF Worlds. Um, so my training right now, uh, it's unlike what it looks like when I don't have, or actually I should say, when I have a, a competition on the horizon, especially a strength sport, it becomes a lot more specialized. And I think people mm. would think that I train for if I train for these uh, multiple sports, I must have like an Oli day and then like a powerlifting day. And then I do bodybuilding accessories. And then I have like a strongman day. I have trained like that, but that was when I set myself the challenge in, um, 2020 bad timing on my part, uh, to do, uh, four different strength. I, I wanted to compete in powerlifting, weightlifting 
and strongman. And uh, that was how I trained during those periods. But most of the time, what I do is I specialize for a sport, considering what time frame I will need uh, to do well in that specific discipline. So for me, who's been training consistently, out of all the different ways I've been training, I've been consistently trying to get bigger in training with including uh, bodybuilding as an element or the primary focus of my training for 18 years now. Um, that means I started basically to all, like all of 2022 has been off season bodybuilding and that will continue until I start my diet in, in Feb. Um, so right now I'm not actually, I don't have a, I don't consistently have like a deadlift squat and a bench press in my program. I will use them in my programming just as vehicles for hypertrophy, but um, like the current block I just did, I had conventional deadlifts uh, and close grip bench, but I didn't have any squat pattern or I didn't have a squat. I was doing leg press, right? Mm -hmm. So right now I train five days per week. Um, I am, I've been running a specialization cycle for the last four or five months uh, so that I'm focusing on my lats, shoulders, and calves, which when I kind of sat down and assessed my physique as objectively as I could, I thought those would have the biggest impact on my symmetry overall and bring up my weak points. So specialization for me uh, is trying to do a combination of things. I'm trying to train these muscles at longer muscle lengths as that data has come out. I'm training them with a mm. higher volume than I am typically accustomed to, and I'm using frequency as a vehicle to get that volume. Um, so currently, every session I do, five days per week, I typically train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I have Wednesday and Sunday off. It starts with either, either a shoulder or a lat movement, and I do four sets. And then after the shoulder or lat movement, I do the, the one remaining, and I do four sets. And then I do four sets of calves. Um, and I will typically train closer to failure and use exercises that focus more on a longer muscle length uh, on Tuesday and Saturday, because I know I have a day off the day afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and nice. then I basically just do like the minimum dose, like probably six to 10 sets for everything else, uh, all my other muscle groups right right now um, that I, I kind of spread out. And I do five exercises a day. So I always know what the 60% of my training is. It's uh, a lat, a shoulder, a calf, and then I just choose two other exercises. And I think about where I want to spread those out, what I want to do. I typically train those a little closer to failure, and I'm very uh, purposeful with choosing exercises that I feel work well for me to um, to efficiently grow the rest of my muscle groups, or at least kind of keep them where they're at, so I don't uh, slide backwards at all. Yeah, lots to unpack there. That's really cool, and it's interesting how I, I was thinking about planning for this episode. I was like, hmm, you know. I realized that Eric and I have a lot of similarities in kind of our overall, like, like our caloric requirements, actually, mm. in prep, where, you know, Eric went down to around 1,200. I ended up going down to, like, 1,000-ish. I was, like, curious to see what his training would be like, and it's interesting because my split right now is is also back, shoulder, and delt focused, and I, like, basically mm. do the same thing. I do, like, I train those groups every session, um, but... and. But very curious to, yeah, kind of hear a bit more. So in terms of sure. the frequency, uh, what counter frequency will you use for your other muscle groups? Yep. Considering you're just doing five exercises a day. For sure. Yeah, and just for a little bit of context, I was on 1,200 calories for like three weeks and only on the low days. So like my average intake for those weeks was like 1,500, 1,600. Um, for those who were like, my God, you competed 80 kilograms. How did you maintain any <laughs> of your size? Yeah, most of the time was at much higher calorie intakes than that. But to answer your question, um, the frequency I use for other muscle groups, it falls between uh, two to three times a week, maybe four times a week if you're thinking about overlap. You know, like if you were to ask me how often I train my triceps or my biceps, you know, because I'm doing lats and delts every day, anytime I do like a press for the, for the delt or a compound pull, you can argue I'm getting some, um, some, some, uh, some buys and tries in there. So for example, I have a two times a week frequency on quads and hammies um, and glutes at the moment. And I have a chest uh, frequency um, three times per week. And I have a direct arm work frequency of one times per week for buys and tries, although ultimately they end up getting 
I think a lot more frequent work than that because I'm doing delts and lats as a focus. Um, so that is not purposeful that I'm choosing those specific frequencies. That's more so uh, an outcome of the volumes I'm trying to achieve and the distribution that I have across the five days that makes sense so that I can, uh, you know, be recovered on time to train the muscle group again. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of progression, how are you running that? I guess Good question. Could, I don't know if this would separate for the different exercises. Yeah. So I've talked about, uh, well, I think on, on Soul Radio, I've talked about uh, periodization for hypertrophy and what we do when we don't mm -hmm. know. And how I think for the most part, uh, what we need uh, that is data behind it and what makes sense conceptually for hypertrophy is more so programming strategies. So I do use periodization in a limited sense in so much as I have auto-regulated deloads. So when my performance has been stagnant or even going down, um, when I'm losing motivation to train, when, I can, when I'm not recovering on time, so I notice that DOMS is lingering or I start to get uh, higher pain perception, old injuries, joint aches and pains, they kind of tend to be a little more flared up. Uh, my overall mood state's lower. That's when I go, you know what, it's probably time for me to take a deload. Uh, those deloads look like me going from five sessions to three sessions per week. So it's basically an automatic 40% reduction in, in volume. And then I also remove any movements that are causing me pain and I change them to something else that is not a totally new, new movement for me that will make me like have a bunch of doms. Um, and I also just remove mentally stressful movements. So the exercises where you like roll your eyes and you think about the setup or you're like, ugh. And I also just stay away from any rep ranges that I am stressed out by, you know. Um, so the, the main way that I periodize is that I alternate between higher rep phases and lower rep phases. Um, hmm. And that's not like singles, doubles, and triples. Typically, that's like training in the 3 to 10 rep range and then training in like the 10 to 20, you know. Um, and there are some movements that I just, I kind of break that rule. Like if they're in there, I'm not going to be going high rep, like for example compound leg movements, I'm typically doing 10 reps or less, almost always, even if I'm in a high rep phase. So those are the general elements of periodization that I have, is shifting between different rep ranges. Um, every block, which tends to be, because they're kind of, I separate them by deloads, so I have these kind of auto-regulated deloads. Uh, I don't change my exercise selection for periods of six to nine weeks at a time, generally. It tends to be when my deloads fall. Um, and the, what else? Ah, uh, yeah, the progression schemes is essentially, I just try to make incremental progress. Um, and when I start to, and what that looks like is I decide for a movement, okay, for this block, do I want to just try to add a rep and get a little closer to failure and then recycle and start at the, the bottom mm -hmm. of the rep range, kind of your, your typical uh, progression pattern of reps go up. And then once you top out, double progression, you go back to the bottom, increase load. Or for some of the compound mm -hmm. movements, I will kind of have a descending rep scheme and increasing load. Um, it's just it's a way to encourage progression. And then some I'll kind of keep at the general rep range and just increase the RPE. And to be honest with you, Bill, I basically choose those progression strategies based upon what I think is feasible and what sounds psychologically nice for a given movement because I don't necessarily think it matters that much so long as progression is built in um, for hypertrophy specifically. Um, yeah, and I am only more intentional with the progression strategies when one of my goals is strength. Uh, then it becomes a, you know, much, like I said, much more intentional. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think I agree with, you know, all that where I think, when it comes to hypertrophy periodization it's hard to say with a lot of these things a lot of this depends on your level as well and which exercises you're using and yeah i mean ultimately as long as you're progressing over time like block to block or mesocycle to mesocycle how exactly you're manipulating whether you're using like a double progression scheme or some some kind of wave loading progression or something like that might not make that much of a difference and what i like what you said about you know finding something that is psychologically less stressful for you like if you just like double progression and it just you know i will always use this word that it grooves right where it's just like oh mm -hmm. yeah i feel like i'm in a good like cycle of training where 
everything is on its way. Things are things are feeling good and strong and comfortable. Where it you know if if you all if you if you feel like you're the type where if you kept the reps the same and you're trying to grind up higher weights and that always stresses you out and you find that you stall quickly out like that then yeah maybe try something else. Yeah, Bill. One of the things I often do is I look at my program for the five or ten minutes before I actually start it, and I look at okay these are the five lifts I'm doing today, um, and what did I do last time. And which one of those do I think I can reasonably progress on in a more straightforward manner, like simply mm. adding a rep um, mm-hmm. or increasing load? And if that's not on the table, or I don't think I'd be able to, with with a reasonable amount of confidence going into the session, then I'll then I'll look back and go like, all right, what rep range have I not done on this exercise for a while? And maybe I can see if I can hit like a new 12 RM or a new three set like 12, not 12 RM because obviously if I do 12, 12, 12. The first one is a submaximal RPE, but a quote unquote volume PR. Like, what's the heaviest load I think I can get for three sets of 12 if I've been training this exercise in the six rep range or the 15 rep range? So I'll, I'll look in and what do I have confidence in that I could progress on one of these movements? And sometimes the answer is I don't think I could progress it. And that's fine. You know, then, then I just try to hold the line or something close to it. I just know it's not a great day for that movement. Uh, but more often than not, I can find some way to progress most of the movements I'm doing kind of with that mindset. And when you have more of these progression strategies on the table, when you train your movements across a variety of rep ranges, you can be like, well, let me see if I can get a new, new set of 15. And like sometimes that's actually not an improvement in performance, but I think it's very psychologically palatable. Like if you just haven't done 15s in a while and you've gotten stronger over six, six months and you go up five pounds from what you did six months ago, it's hard enough to, to stimulate progress and it's a good enough stimulus, um, but it's probably not an objective increase in the you know the amount of tension you're supplying to the muscle, but that motivates you and then the next time you do it, you, 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 know, you add load and do a harder set of 15 and then eventually you do hit a PR. So that's kind of the mentality I take as someone who's been training for someone's, you know, whole adult life technically 18 years right (laughs) is Mm -hmm. i i look for ways to find progress because i find that motivates me it keeps me training hard um and it makes me feel like i'm driving towards something and i think that creates the training environment which uh is is most conducive to making progress um so that's kind of how i view progression especially for hypertrophy and i think a key element that allows me to do that is that i do track like I, i can look back at workouts that i did you know like five years ago in Gravitas, for example. Um, and I might be moving over to Boost Camp soon because that's a pretty cool app too. But in before apps, I had training logs. I had books and books and books and books and books of training logs, you know, from say 2016 and prior, you know. And I just had like, sometimes I'd use my note in, 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 in on my phone or whatever. So I am I'm very good memory with, um, with numbers and people's trainings, probably from my career as a personal trainer. So I'm very aware in most cases like what are my best for, for, for a lot of lifts more so for being a strength athlete. Cause you focus on, you know, three lifts or five lifts or a certain number for bodybuilding. I do find having that training log really helps. Cause I've got like, you know, a stable of 30 exercises I'm doing or something like that. Um, and knowing what my eight RM currently, or my best eight RM was in the last year on, you know, a, a low incline dumbbell press. That I'm, I'm, I'm assisted by having that logbook, and then I can make those kind of decisions. Yeah, it's, it's really cool, you know, seeing that perspective where kind of you following, you follow this kind of auto-regulated triple progression type of thing where all of the variables of, you know, how much weight you're moving, the, the, um, as well as the rep ranges are a little are fluid, and you kind of mm. choose them on the day. And it's the cool thing about bodybuilding where we have all these different avenues for progression, right? Like you could increase weight or you could get a new, you could add a rep or you could choose a different rep range and get a new, you know, 15 RM on that. If you haven't done 15s in a while. And yeah, when you realize that you have all of those possibilities, you have this whole kind of menu that you can choose from. And yeah, it, it may be debatable as to whether, you know, lifting a hundred pounds for 12 reps is better than, you know, like 120 pounds for less reps, like whether, whether that's a actual strength increase, but it is an increase compared to what you were doing before, like perhaps in the last block or in the in prior years. 
and you realize that there are all these different ways. Obviously, this is more an advanced concept where I think a lot of beginners may have difficulty, you know, figuring that out. But when you mm. start getting more advanced, it becomes a useful tool. Absolutely. And um, also, it, it does connect with some bigger picture concepts that I pay attention to. So this specialization cycle I'm running, like I said, I've got about six to 10 sets per week for the other uh, body parts that I'm not purposely focusing on, uh, probably mm. closer to 12 to 15 with indirect work, if you count, you know, buys, tries. Um, and then for my, you know, delts, calves and lats, I'm doing 20 sets per week. Mm. And for me, if you look at my training history, basically 12 to 15 sets is the, the most I've done in recent times for those three muscle groups. So this is a reasonable increase in volume, but a similar amount of total volume per week that I do if you account for all just total sets across all muscle mm -hmm. groups that I normally do. So this is a periodization strategy, a specialization cycle, uh, where I'm just simply emphasizing certain muscle groups by making a reasonable increase in volume and other ones I'm making a reasonable decrease in volume that I think would be sufficient to maintain uh, my current muscle mass. Uh, kind of the idea there, and this is, like I said, theoretical, is that I'm freeing up resources to focus where I want my adaptation and recovery to occur. Um, and you can use this strategy as an advanced lifter when you find that it's anecdotally seems harder to get progress on all muscle groups simultaneously and that you can kind of pick your spots. This is something powerlifters can sometimes relate to that after the novice stage, it's almost never happens that you can get all three lifts to simultaneously increase really well, uh, at least not consistently. But if you get two, you're doing great, you know, and if you can just hold the line with one, then that's a fantastic, you know, uh, period of training. And I think to some degree, the same uh, I've observed in, in bodybuilding. Um, if you really focus on a, a handful of select exercises, put more effort and volume into, you know, and, and, and a well thought out plan, plan to account for recovery, and you have the nutritional support, you can you can see some pretty uh, impressive gains in the context of an advanced natural lifter over a reasonably short time period using this approach, and you can hold the line with the other muscle groups. And this is definitely something I do with uh, bodybuilders I work with who have physiques that have more glaring structural flaws, if you will. Not even necessarily that they actually have like small delts or lats. I actually don't think I do. I just think I have a narrow frame. Um, like I would say most people who look at my side shots wouldn't think I have small delts. But I think if you look at me from the front, you'd think I'd benefit from having bigger delts. And same could be true of my lats. So that's the, the type of approach that I use to improve the symmetry and the overall balance of a physique in high level lifters, that, that kind of uh, advanced strategy. I don't think it's very useful for the, probably the most people who are listening to this call. I think they have plenty of quote unquote runway to, to make progress on, on their physique more, more holistically. And I notice that people often do specialization cycles way too early in their career. And they don't even necessarily have a good mind muscle connection um, with the, all, all the exercises they might be using, which might even be the cause of their, their weak body parts. So piling on a bunch of poorly performed, non, you know, really connected mm. feeling movements is, is typically not the answer anyway. So yeah, I think that's, so that, that's something that people should remember is that I go through a phase of this and then what am I going to do is I'm going to kind of make my program more symmetrical in terms of volume. I'll decrease the frequency on lats, calves, and, and, and delts, increase the, uh, sorry, the volume, in, 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 sorry, I'll decrease the volume by decreasing the frequency on those muscle groups and I'll bring it back up on everything else. I'll go to a more symmetrical program and, you know, then kind of assess and make a decision from there. And I may end up, like I found in my past, that I'm always running an asymmetrical program to some degree. Like previously, I just noticed that my upper body was lagging in general compared to my legs. And for the past 10 years now, I have trained with 50% more volume on my upper body than my lower. And that's quote unquote normal for me. So I've fallen upon an individualized uh, kind of approach to where the specialization mm -hmm. cycle sort of never ended. So it's possible that happens again, that I'm always training with a lot more volume on my delts and lats, although I'm not sure. I'm interested to see if I can bring it up and then, you know, keep progressing uh, in a more, you know, with the more baseline approach to, to training that I have. So um, one thing people might be asking is, hey, why aren't you manipulating like set volume? And the approach that I find is um, most intuitive and allows me to 
uncover the most answers and, and figure things out is that I don't manipulate set volume until I see how a given amount of set volume for different muscle groups progress. Uh, so like I pick a volume, I run multiple blocks of training and I see if it's working or not. And by quote unquote working, the, the question is, is the overload sufficient for me to be, for me to progress? That's kind of the, the take on progressive overload I have. So if I'm doing 20 sets, it's structured well, the nutritional support is there, I'm sleeping. And I think that is an increase in volume that should stimulate some progress and stimulate some hypertrophy, then I hopefully should be seeing uh, performance increases on those movements. And if I am, then sweet, I'm not going to change it. But if I'm not, then I assess, am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? And then the next, like three blocks from now, I might make a volume adjustment. So I use my performance progress to decide when to adjust sets rather than doing that on, say, a week to week basis. Because I think that's just too frequent for, say, an advanced lifter uh, when the performance changes you're going to see can be masked by fatigue. Yeah, I think that's important to consider where with a lot of these manipulations and training, especially when you're more advanced, it takes quite a bit of time to see any kind of change or even like a result from your experiment, right? Where mm -hmm. I remember I remember working in this chemistry lab when I was an undergrad student and we'd do these little organic chem experiments when I was trying to grow these carbon nanotubes. You like you basically put some carbon and substrates on a little plate you put inside this this 800 degree oven and then you just leave it there for like eight hours so like every time i would like change the recipe for growing these little guys and i would have to like put put it in the oven and then then i just have to wait for eight hours for it to come out to see what happened and it's like every time you've, you've got to wait to to actually see what happened so yeah like in terms of how many how many sets per week you're running on a certain muscle group perhaps you can't know the effect of what the, the your your experiment you know how that turns out until at least a few months down the line yep. where you just kind of got to run it yep and to kind of steel man an approach where you do use set manipulation you certainly can do that and you just need to look at like your average sets like let's say you go you have a progression where you go 10 12 14 16 d load right your average number of sets would be like 14 i didn't do the math there or maybe 15 but i it, it's somewhere around there math alludes me it's hard um and then you would just go, okay, if my average was 14 or 15 sets for, for three months and I was able to progress fantastic, then you use that in your calculus. And you would just, like, let's say you wanted to take a similar approach to me. Like, let's say I wanted to restructure my training, but have a set progression. I would just go, you know, like four, six, eight sets for all my non-specialized muscle groups. And I would do something like, uh, you know, 18, 20, 22 for my, uh, my specialized muscle groups and just run that cyclically. And then deload when I when I felt necessary, and it would produce the same average volumes, um, but I would probably see more week to week changes in performance that were a little more variable because I was having these relatively large excursions uh, in volume. It would sort of take care of itself. I probably, you know, that 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 first week would act as somewhat of a deload, but it's just another way to get there, and I personally find it. Uh, a, l a little higher of a like noise to signal ratio, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then circling back and starting to get a little bit more into the details here, in terms of your other muscle groups, how are those spread out throughout the week? Like, do you have a base split? Uh, no, it is, it is essentially quote unquote full body, which is not full body. Um, so whenever I write yeah. training programs for myself, or with lifters who are comfortable to let me write it in this manner. Uh, it doesn't, you know, break their, their bodybuilding, you know, cultural pr preferences. Um, <laughs> is that I it's morally basically... morally acceptable. Yes, exactly. They, they don't want to get arrested by the bodybuilding split police. <laughs> um, is I will just go, all right, what is the target volume that I want per muscle group? What are the exercises we have access to and that we want to use? Um, and then... If I'm going to have certain exercises that are trained at a higher RPE or longer muscle lengths or that they're not you know, familiar with, or if this person just tends to experience more DOMS than others, then where would I put that? So let's say they've got an exercise that is, you know, close grip bench, pause at the bottom, training to failure. They're probably going to get a lot of chest DOMS, right? Long muscle length. And then we've got another exercise uh, that is, you know, 
I can't think of a good example for chest right now. We'll use a powerlifting example, like a board press, you know, or, or max legal width grip bench that is wider than their competition bench. And they're doing it heavy with less volume and not to failure. Um, those are going to have different recovery requirements, right? The, the former might have an additional 24 hours before they're able to get their force production capabilities back up. So I'm going to think, all right, these need to be at least two days apart. And then I need to think about, okay, where are they shoulder pressing, right? Where's their tricep work? So essentially, I just look at all the different pieces and I think about where can I place them in such a way that contributes to the program where I can maintain the highest quality of training for the most movements uh, while still reaching the target volume. Um, so it becomes something that looks pretty inherently customized. So for example, um, I have one day a week where I do uh, bench press right now. I have one day a week where I do uh, flies with dumbbells where I'm in the lengthened position. I don't come all the way up. And I have one day a week where I do a, uh, like a cable crossover, but I, I go through the full range of motion and it's a little higher reps. Um, those I pretty much just space out throughout the week. So it's like day one, three and five. Right. And I'm, and I'm pretty much good to go. It doesn't really matter how those get slotted around. Um, but on the other hand, I have a uh, standing leg curl that I do on the cable stack. And then I do either an RDL or like a deadlift. And I find those I have to pay attention to where I put them because I can do the leg curl pretty much any time I want. But the RDL mm -hmm. will interfere with my leg pressing or my squat pattern where there's a good bit of gluten in it. So those have to be a part. And then I can't have the leg curl right before, or right after that RDL. So like that is what ends up resulting in what looks to be a quote unquote full body split. But some days I'm not training certain muscle groups, you know, like I'm only going to hit the, the, the quads twice a week and the hams twice a week. So there's one day where I'm basically the only leg thing I'm training is calves, you know. So um, it's essentially not having a restriction on which body parts I train. And I find that allows me more flexibility to program the way I want to get to my target uh, amount of stress. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's, it's like playing Tetris thing where mm -hmm. you like you slot down your big players like there are some lifts like rdls as you said where they're kind of uh more disruptive in the week and they like force you to think about the other muscle groups around it where you know sometimes i like i ran i basically ran a modified full body split as well most of this year just while prepping for like just fatigue issues but uh loved it for that same reason with a, the your customizability but you know, like, because when initially when you think, oh, I'm going to run a full body split, I'll just randomly slot down exercises and you realize, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of interactions between exercises you need to consider, but you kind of slot down your big players, the really fatiguing ones. As you mentioned before, I really like that kind of nuance point of putting your, you know, lengthened or like stretch type exercises sort of at the end of whatever cycle or like mini cycle, intra week cycle you have so that your muscle group can recover before being trained again. So like I'll always have like, say my, my over the, over the head extension, like a, a skull crusher or something. I know mm -hmm. that's going to make me sore. So I'll, I'll put it at the end of over like day four so that I know that I have a, at least a day off uh, after that. That's a great way to go. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have like a complex understanding of, you know, what exacerbates muscle damage response in PubMed. It's more so just like what exercise are you currently doing? And which ones make you feel beat up the next day and where, or is it, you know, bigger picture, you know, overall fatigue, psychologically, you know, metabolically, like if you are currently choosing to do sets of 15 on deadlifts or squats, just because you like it. And I'm not going to tell you not to, even though I'd probably tell you, like, if I was going to do it, I would do, do it on like hack squat, you know, leg press or, or something a, a little less, you know, full body, free weight compound, a uh, little lower risk profile, et cetera. Um, then you might just need to have an easy day. It doesn't matter what exercise you do. If you just did three sets of 15 at an eight RPE on squats or deadlifts the day prior, your next day and the rest of that workout might just need to be easy shit, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Or you really like to have one of those days where you're nervous all day, you're trying not to puke. Um, I find that once I got away from that thinking that I had to do that mentally, um, I started being able to train harder on average on more days. 
I get that a lot of people are like, yeah, but a leg day should put you in the hole. Like, like it's almost viscerally hard for me to say, hey, <laughs> distribute your training in a way so that every day is a little bit easier. But it's in service of training more effectively. So um, one of the, the my individual characteristics is that I just don't need that much volume on my lower body to grow effectively. And I've done a ton of volume on my lower body. Like when I was doing Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting at the same time, mm. It was crazy. Like I, I had to get hip surgery. You know, I was doing so much lower body volume. So, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, I've done it. Like I've done, uh, I've done small love. I've done the Shiko programs. I've done, like I said, Olympic weightlifting and, and powerlifting five day per week training where every day I'm doing some type of squat, whether it's a clean, whether it's a front squat, whether it's a high bar squat, a low bar squat, snatches or an accessory squat movement. Um, so yeah, I've squatted five days per week and it wasn't necessarily better than when I was squatting with one fourth of that volume, even to be a hundred percent honest for my leg development. So because of that, that means that I'm getting very little out of having these like hardcore leg days. I don't need two dedicated leg days per week. So why would I, if it, especially if it takes away from my ability to focus and put forth energy um, and recover for the stuff that really does need to grow in my body, which is my upper body. So your mileage may vary. If you're somebody who has traditionally kind of had chicken legs and you need to do a lot of volume from your lower body, then you may need to take a different approach. But for me, I essentially never have leg days and I haven't for the past four years. Um, and I think the, my legs, the best I ever looked was 2019, which is when I kind of committed to this schedule during prep. Uh, I had basically trialed in the off season for t all of 2017 and 2018. Cause I knew I was going to get back on stage. Uh, I was trialing either upper lower splits or full body splits. And I kept wanting to stick with the upper lower just because it seemed like, like that's an acceptable <laughs> approach, you know, and for bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would just notice I was rating my session RPEs, like how hard was this session out of 10? And I was looking at the amount of volume I was trying to accomplish. And when I would accomplish the same volume per muscle group organized as an upper lower approach, I was doing three uppers, two lowers, uh, or as this kind of way, I think a way I've described of not having restrictions, this full body esque approach on five days, I could get to the same volumes, but have higher session RPEs and higher and a higher frequency of deloads, which I think is important that I felt were needed when I was doing upper lower and I could get more volume with the same level of effort on that, the kind of way of organizing it now. So once I saw that, once I could look back at my data and my session RPEs and, and how like my, my, my own personal block reviews, I was like, this is a better approach. It doesn't really matter what, you know, your typical bodybuilder would think of it or what Eric of 2008 would think of the, you know, me, you know, like my, my cultural attachment to having hard days is less important mm -hmm. than what is successfully working and I have data on. So, um, yeah, I, I find that that is what works for me psychologically and objectively from what I've seen. Uh, but it's not necessarily a recommendation. I think it, it does relate to um, a combination of factors that are, are not necessarily uniquely me, but are not that common. And some people might look at this and be like, oh, this is a good, that's a great way to go. And other people are like, that wouldn't work for me. I need high volume, high intensity, you know, lower body work to grow effectively. So I'm going to have to have some leg days or things that look like it no matter what. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it, it's fascinating because I'm kind of like going in the reverse where I was going full body and now I'm switching back to an upper lower. And I like, I very much saw that it became apparent that I've switched up a lot of exercises just from transitioning uh, different phases, but on the exercises that have been the same, when I rearranged them from like a full body high frequency approach on, onto like leg days, I couldn't perform to the same degree. Like I, I wasn't getting as many reps on like my leg extensions, say like leg extensions usually come at the end of the workout for me. And you know, on a full body day, they would kind of get their own time in the sun. And uh, I coming back to leg extensions at the end of a workout, I can't get the same number of reps on the same weight. Like it's very clear that the productive volume I'm getting wasn't working. So anyways, obviously there are other considerations and like for, for example, like when I was less, less per advanced, I suppose the fatigue just wasn't that much of an issue. Like I wasn't moving that much weight in general. 
so I didn't have to worry about these kinds of things. But yeah, at an advanced level, it's a very kind of illuminating switch. Mm -hmm. I think the, the one last interesting thing to talk about my current split and what I'm also doing is that for the last mm. six weeks, I have been doing stretching on my calves with an orthotic device, mm. which um, is also part of a, I'm, like, I'm, a, I'm my own case study. Uh, that we're actually collecting data on. So sick. Yeah, there was a really interesting study by Warnicke and colleagues that came out, I think, last year, where they took untrained individuals and they had them uh, use it within subjects design. They they had one calf that for an hour per day, they would stretch out of an eight out of ten discomfort using this orthotic device that basically pulls them into dorsiflexion and they'd have it straight out sitting on a uh, like you know a chair at hip height. Um. And they found that the muscle thickness measured by ultrasound increased by 15% on the stretch leg. So, you know, terms and conditions apply. This is a, as Pac would say, this is this is a untrained group. You know, if they had been training, would that be a redundant stimulus or would it be an additive or would it be complimentary? Don't know. And I was curious enough to where I thought I would like to try this. And I was feeling like, which is not necessarily an objective measure that even though I'd gone to 20 sets on calves, that it wasn't that like they were as big as they had ever been, but they didn't seem like they were progressing beyond that. So I'd been doing the specialization split leading into it. And I thought, you know what, screw it. Let's, let's add the stretching on top of it. And I started sharing this idea with some of my colleagues and students and my colleague, uh, Dr. Alyssa Joy Spence, who did her PhD on the effect of stretching in powerlifting performance was like, Hey, I love, I love this idea. B, we're going to do it right. And this is going to be a study. <laughs> and then my student Kai Homer, uh, who is, uh, you know, really interested in loves bodybuilding. Um, he was like, yeah, I want in on this. I was like, all right, let's do it. So what we did was we got four weeks of baseline measurements before I started stretching just on a weekly basis, uh, getting my ultrasound measurements of, of calf thickness. So we could see, am I actually plateaued right now? Or am I slowly changing, you know, something with a pretty high, uh, you know, clarity and precision an ultrasound muscle thickness measure from a very experienced operator. Uh, and then, and we're also looking at different regions. So like, you know, medial, lateral, upper, middle, you know, a bunch of stuff. We also got a baseline uh, circumference measurement. And then after the four weeks, I started doing the stretching and I'm doing stretching on both calves. So it's basically hmm. two hours per day, six days a week. So I'm taking one day a week off on top of the 20 sets of calves I'm doing. Um, so it's, definitely not fun. About 20 minutes in, my calf starts to go numb. I get tingles up my leg and I'm, I'm in uncomfortable pain. And then I go sweet, just 40 minutes left. And then I switch legs. So I start that around like 8 PM every night while we're watching Netflix after we're done working and finished with dinner. Um, or if I've got something ongoing in the evening, I wake up and I do it while I'm on a podcast, you know? So the, uh, but I haven't missed any sessions. I've been able to get, you know, six, it's for, it'll be six weeks at the end of this week. The, the midpoint measurement, I'm going back in on Friday to get the ultrasound scan, and then I've got six weeks remaining. And then at the end of it, what we're going to do is we're going to take a week where I go back to uh, baseline volume. So I'll just do like three days a week of four sets. Uh, so I'll be going from 20 to 12 sets, and I'll stop stretching. And we'll see if I maintain it, or maybe it was too much, and I get a little compensatory response, or what have you. But in total, it's like a 17-week study. Where we're comparing my baseline rate of gain to what happens when I add in the stretching, uh, and uh, and we shall see. We're also measuring like isometric calf strength using a strain gauge, basically a mid thigh pull, but using a, a dip belt, uh, and we're also measuring uh, my actual dorsiflexion range of motion, which seems to be increasing a lot because I'm running out of room on how to tighten the uh, the Velcro straps on this this calf. Uh, it's basically a plantar fasciitis stretching device that I found on Amazon that looks similar enough to the Warnicke study. <laughs> but the, the Velcro is worn Sounds like a down. torture device. It is. I'm running out of, of range, and I'm going to have to go get some like clamps from, from a hardware store to, to like hold it in place to keep going. But anyway, that's another little element that I'm using at the moment to, to see if we can, we can make these, uh, these calves become cows. Wow hot off the press, innovative training techniques. All I can say is sounds like a stretch, but maybe it'll work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Should be a good uh, title of the paper. <clears throat> um, in, in terms of 
the oh yeah i want to come back to um rir what's your approach for rir right now yeah good question so um if i am training uh an exercise that doesn't you know train me at long muscle lengths i train at a higher rir so just generally just closer mm -hmm. to failure so for example um like a preacher curl you know something like that a dumbbell lateral raise for example mm -hmm. um and for those exercises i'm basically just trying to add reps and go to failure or add load and, and go close to failure by my last set of the exercise so i typically like start at the nine rpe and then i just let it trail up and i try to maintain reps sometimes i can't it might be like you know 10 reps at a nine 10 reps at a 10 maintain load and only get eight and hit failure um, for my other exercises, I stay short of failure and I typically start around a six or a seven RPE on the first set. So a three to four RIR, and then I stick with the same load and rep combination. I let the, the RIR, you know, just climb up naturally, um, which I find is a nice gauge of how much my fatigue set to set. Am I resting long enough, et cetera? Uh, and how am I doing from last week? Am I carrying over any fatigue? Uh, and then I will just increase load incrementally each week uh, for the most part. Not always, sometimes I'll add reps and let the RPE climb or not. You know, if I'm, if I'm on a good run, I can add load and I also seem to start even with a higher load at a six to seven RPE, but eventually it catches up with me. I'm not able to add, you know, that kind of, you know, progress on a weekly basis at this stage. Um, so eventually, typically what happens is I end up with those exercises in those rep ranges, getting closer and closer to training at a, a high RP all the time. And that's inevitably what happens before I need a deload. And then I just kind of recycle it. So for the most part, I'm training between a seven to 10 RP or a zero to three RIR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. It's very similar to what I do. It's kind of nice. Yeah. As you said, kind of having that pretty stable, rep ranges but letting the RIR climb up gives you a nice gauge of how things are going and also nice when you're tracking things where things are relatively trackable yep where I find that's helpful kind of looking at your overall like your overall set volume I mean workout volume like yes. rather than just per set but looking at cumulative volumes across the whole workout or across the week mm -hmm. and then yeah and then zooming out a little bit in terms of specialization, this has been a great little side topic to explore here. What special, like have you run specialization blocks in the past for, from a bodybuilding perspective, besides what you said about, you know, being more upper body focused? Yeah. Initially it very much was a, a, uh, a specialization cycle and then became my, my norm. And I saw an immediate benefit because I was in, this was a time period like 2011 is when I first started doing this, where it was kind of heresy to train anything more than like twice a week, you know, um, because the assumption was that you were training to failure and doing high volumes per session. So it was just considered too much. And no one was really advocating for a moderate session volume, moderate intensity, higher frequency approach. Um, that was, I, mean, I guess that's not true. There was hyper... Hypertrophy specific training, HST, which never got that popular, but describes a lot of what we're doing today uh, that was was around back then for those who, who who were deep on the interwebs. And there were some some adherence to that. But that's the only system I'm aware of that really promoted that type of approach around this era. So I started trying going, you know what, let me do like uh, three upper body sessions per week. Let's see if I can recover. Let's see if I can do it. Still to a pretty, like I wasn't going all the way to failure. I did accommodate a little bit, um, but for the most part, it was pretty hard sessions. And I noticed an immediate response. And within, I would say, two to three months, it was the biggest my upper body had ever been. And I just finished a contest prep too. And I was like, damn it. Like, <laughs> I, I, I just learned something. Um, and I remember in 2013, 2014, 2015, after doing this for a few years, a number of my friends noticed like, yo, you look like you were, you put on a lot of size, like what happened? And I also allowed my body weight to get up nice and reasonably high. Um, for the first time I'd been up closer to 220 or hundred kilos. Um, and yeah, that, that kind of peaked and petered out around 2017. And then I was like, all right, let's bring it back down to a reasonable thing and compete. So that started the specialization cycle and just became what I did. But in the interim, I have run other specialization cycles for my upper body. 
I've done some um, some like chest. Like I've done bench specialization cycles, which I did notice made my delts and and chest and triceps seemed like they looked really really good during those time periods, which mm. was informative for me. Um, so that concept has been there, and I have done. I tried to do an arm specialization cycle for a while, but my elbow tendonitis just got way out of control, and I think I would probably now at the young age of 39 turning 40 i think i would be able to do that in such a way that would not cause that issue i know which exercises i can do more volume with and what is a reasonable amount compared to where i'm at i basically just was like let me just train arms every day and i did mostly free weights and then you know within two weeks i was screwed so um mm -hmm. yeah i've had negative experiences with, with specialization cycles uh and i've had positive ones and i have a much better handle on it and i know I wrote an article on it for the 3DMJ blog, not too, actually it was a fair amount of time ago in the last few years, <laughs> um, which I still think is pretty good where it describes probably not selecting more than, you know, two major muscle groups and one minor muscle group at a time. And, you know, essentially taking an incremental increase from your current level of volume. So you need to know what your baseline is. And then, hmm. at, and if you're using a couple of major muscle groups and a minor muscle group, and that's how, the way you want to run it, probably actually decreasing volume on other things. But if you're just focusing on like one minor muscle group, like you want to run a calf specialization cycle or an arm specialization cycle, you can essentially just leave the rest of your training unchanged and just, you know, kick the volume up a little bit and just be a little more strategic with your placement. So yeah, I've thought about this a fair bit. I've done it with a fair amount of clients and I have done both successful and unsuccessful cycles for myself. Yeah. And I like what you mentioned earlier about considering your overall total recoverability and that, you know, as animals, we probably have some limited recover recoverability resources. And when you're adding volume to certain muscle groups, you may have to subtract from others where when someone says, Oh, I'm going to run a back specialization cycle. You don't just keep everything the same and just like double your back volume or double your quad volume and leave everything else. And <clears throat> what you, you where you have to be smart about where you're allocating your resources ultimately mm -hmm. 100 percent. in terms of setting things up for contest prep is there anything specific you're doing in this phase to set you up um yeah i the, the timing of when i thought about how to run this calf stretching study um <laughs> yeah and then True. like the four week lead in and all that stuff. I looked at it and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to finish this until like the first week in February. So it's actually interfered with my timeline a little bit because my plan was that I would actually take January as a uh, cleanup to get myself down from like 95, 96 kilos, probably down to something like 91 kilos, you know, do a, a mini cut and then spend... Um, February at maintenance and increasing my calories as much as I could without gaining weight and then properly start my diet in March. Um, that worked really well for me in 2019 because I, like I said, I, in those prior years to 2019 prep, I had pushed my body weight all the way up to hundred kilos. Like that was the, the last bulk that I might ever do. Um, <laughs> and it seemed pretty effective, but I was like, I don't want to start a diet at hundred kilos. I'm not trying to lose 40 pounds to get in stage shape. So, um, I spent, two different uh, month long periods in 2018, um, in the first quarter and the last quarter, um, or the third quarter, first and third quarter of 2018 doing mini cuts so that I could start prep around 90. And that was really good because then I only had to lose about 10 kilos to get in shape. Um, so what's not happening this time is probably that because I don't want to introduce a confounder and start dieting in the middle of this, this calf experiment. So when I finish the study in early Feb, I will just start dieting. So I'm kind of, instead of breaking it up, I'm just going to have an extended dieting phase. Is that worse? Maybe. I think it'll be okay, though. I haven't told Berto yet. So he might find out by listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Berto if you're listening to this. That's right. Anyways, yeah, that's going to be really exciting. Seeing you getting into prep and we'll be able to follow along and see all these high level manipulations happening Should so be fun. yeah i think this has been a really fun fun episode and it's great to be able to kind of look into your world and look into the advanced kind of considerations we're talking about here without having to you know mince our words or like you know be 
double thinking everything we we say to for for you know a beginner audience or someone specific who's listening to it but just talking kind of documenting your kind of training setup and some of the lessons that we got from it yeah i think on that note bill the um Mm -hmm. as a listener this is potentially just entertainment to listen to but i think there's actually a lot more here and the thing to learn is not how eric helms trains but the questions that you should ask as you become more advanced and the potential roadblocks to what progress uh to, to achieving the progress you want both in terms of the ability to actually diagnose when you're progressing uh, how to manage you know the fatigue versus stimulus um, and the type of time courses and the type of considerations like structural uh, fatigue related you know prior injury history goals so I think a lot of people when they get to a certain level or uh, a certain degree of development uh, they they don't really know what to do and the, the way that process starts is just by figuring out what questions to ask and what variables to consider. So I think even if you come to a very different split for yourself or an advanced client you're working with, this hopefully, if you were paying attention, should help you figure out which variables to pay attention to, which questions to ask, and which things to track and monitor and over what time courses, even if you land on a very, very different approach to what I think works for me at the moment. Yeah, well said, where just understanding like, oh, these are the, this is kind of the spectrum of things that Eric has done over his training career, like with a volume question, for example, where saying, oh, you know, maybe you may, you may not need the same amount of volume your whole life, like, you know, for your legs, for example, where you said you've, you've realized you didn't need really high leg volumes to be progressing. And just, just knowing that someone like Eric has done that and pulled back leg volumes and not had trouble with it just gives people that option or you know that card in the back pocket 100 percent. so yeah that was a really fun time fun question what's a piece of non-fitness advice that you would have given yourself when you're 20 if you could speak to that person that eric let's see what was a piece of non-fitness advice i could give myself in my early 20s um don't worry about what other people think about your your career arc and just focus on doing what it will get you to where you want to be that's deep well what was the career arc path that you were you know thinking i think at the time i I remember there was a point early in the 3dmj days where i knew i was being seen as like the science guy because i had a a proclivity towards that and interest and I had a reputation for being knowledgeable on the forums but I didn't feel like I had the uh, the credentials yet because I mean you can't fast track 10 years of education it takes guess what 10 years um, <laughs> which you know well as a doctor um, yeah, so I, like- I remember I took like 15 different like like PT courses so I can have all these letters after my name that essentially just cost a lot of money. And <laughs> um, I that I didn't learn things from them, but like, did I really need like NASM's performance nutrition specialist certification <laughs> at that point in my career? Did I really need a corrective es- exercise specialist certification? Uh, did I really need the NASM performance enhancement specialist certification? Uh, did I really need three different PT certs from ISSA, NASM, and NSCA, you know? So there was a long time where I was just paying a lot of money to maintain a bunch of certifications where I probably could have just let go of most of them, you know, and just thought about which ones actually look good on my CV and are helpful rather than me trying to compensate because I don't have my bachelor's or my master's or my PhD yet. Um, and some of that was because I was thinking, all right, you know, who are the representatives who I, I can see as someone I can I can mold my career afterwards? And it was like, you know, Lane and Dr. Joe. So they were definitely leveraging the fact that I think at the time uh, Lane was in the middle of his PhD and Dr. Joe had like 14 PhDs or whatever. And uh, yeah, I just kind of being a little more accepting of where I was at and not trying to fake it until I made it, but just putting in the hard yards and, and being what I was at the time and, and letting my my uh, abilities speak for themselves because I was doing fine, 
and I was only getting better. Uh, but I think sometimes you try to present yourself as, as more than you know, and it makes you make worse decisions um, or more ego-driven decisions, or sometimes you even protect uh, your ignorance so that it's not seen. And that actually is a barrier to your own learning. Uh, displaying your ignorance is the pathway to, to learning, right? Uh, displaying it to primarily yourself being honest, but sometimes that means other people seeing it too. And I think that's actually a good thing to model, but it took me some time to understand that. That's deep. Yeah. I love it. I'm just reading the Tao Te Ching right now. It's, for people who don't know, it's kind of like the, the Bible Taoism, all the Eastern philosophy, but just kind of like a lot of the things that we kind of see in our modern society where people are very impatient, mm. you know, and, and ego driven where it's, it's hard to just be humble or just to take your time and letting things come along with time and as as they should. But anyways, coming back to uh, the podcast here. Yeah, what's where can people find you just wrapping up? Yeah, so if uh, you want to engage with, with us and potentially find some, some further content to help your, your own personal journey, uh, check us out at 3dmusclejourney.com. That is the number three, the letter D, then the words musclejourney.com. From there, you can find links to my books, um, our monthly research review, Mass. Uh, you can find links to our podcast, the 3DMJ podcast, and our blog. Only other place to find good stuff would be to check out Iron Culture, where myself and Omar talk about all kinds of stuff under the umbrella of history, science, and culture of lifting. Uh, and then you can kind of see what other appearances I make, like this one right here, by following me on Instagram at Helms3DMJ. There you go. So I'll put those links in the description. Thanks again for being on the show, Eric. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.